Hey guys, it's Dr. Rich here with Ask a Former Atheist. And so as you know, uh, we have kicked off the so-called Pride Month, uh, the month that the world has set aside to celebrate all things LGBTQ and to push that revolution in sexuality upon society as a whole. Expecting, uh, by the way, less and less resistance every year, don't they? So um, in response to that, we've decided to designate the month of June to be Humility Month, uh, a month of humility, okay, in contrast to what the world recognizes as Pride Months. Uh, so not surprisingly, as you would expect, as a former atheist, I used to be a, a supporter of LGBTQ, um, especially when I was leading the atheist group at the University of Georgia, UGA Atheists, back in 2009, 2010, 2011. And I remember remarking, and they thought it was hilarious uh, at the time. If I said this today, I probably would get booed out of the room or off the streets. But I looked around and I said, hey guys, have you noticed that, you know, we have 40 or 50 people in here at our UGA Atheist meetings, and uh, like half of y'all are gay. So, you know, I'm thinking maybe we should start calling this group UGA Gaytheists instead of UGA Atheists. And uh, they thought it was like the funniest thing they ever heard. Um, but there, is, there does tend to be that strong, strong association between uh, the so-called LGBTQ community and uh, religious skepticism, atheism, agnosticism. So what I want to do here, if I could get my computer to cooperate, and I'm going to give more background today than I do on subsequent videos. Um, you know, I've been on the front lines um, in this in this worldview showdown for the past eight years, uh, pretty much full time, engaging these types of issues, and having been on the other side of this ideology as well, I'm extremely familiar with the types of things that the uh, members of the LGBT community and their allies will ask and say to us and about us. And so this month, my goal is to post one video each day, and the subsequent ones are going to be like a real short, a minute or two at the most. This one a little longer because I have to give background. But each day this month, I want to post a video that identifies and responds to their common questions and criticisms regarding Christianity, the Bible, especially as it intersects human sexuality, the kinds of objections that they will routinely offer. Okay, so here's today's question. Uh, question number one. Here it is. Since we know, since we now know that people are born gay, right, why do you Christians still oppose homosexuality? We know that people are born gay today, right? And so why are y'all still so homophobic or anti-gay? I mean, when did you, when did you decide that you would become straight? Okay, I've heard that question dozens, if not hundreds of times. So when did you, did you wake up one morning when you were 12 or 13 or 15 and decide that you would become straight? And so we hear this very commonly. Okay, a couple of things are going on right here we'll look at. It all starts with an untrue claim about people being born gay. That's just simply not scientifically true. That's not factual. This is patently false, scientifically, and as a neuroscientist who taught biological psychology at the university level for over a decade, I can assure you that there is no such thing as the biological or the physiological determination of sexual orientation. Doesn't just doesn't work that way. In fact, you know, here's something interesting. I've actually not changed my position on this since I was an atheist neuroscience professor. You've probably heard the song or you're familiar with it. It's sort of like an anthem of Pride Month, right, and all things LGBTQ. Uh, the, the, the recording artist who calls herself Lady Gaga, in 2011 she 
uh, redu uh, released a song that was a huge hit called Born This Way. And the idea is I'm on the right track. I was born this way. My sexuality was programmed into my body and my brain from the very time that I was born. Okay. And I remember very distinctly um, telling my class, referencing that song and say, hey, guys, I am not a religious person. I wasn't at the time. I don't have a dog in this fight. Uh, I'm not moralizing about this issue. Uh, that's not where I'm going. But just scientifically, that's not true. It's simply untrue scientifically that people are born um, either gay or straight. Uh, that, that's just not the case. People are not born gay. Okay, And even more so today, as the evidence has come out, um, that has been demonstrated to even be more of a solid scientific position today than it was back in 2011. Genes do not determine sexual orientation. In fact, I don't have time to go through a lot of stuff here, but I'll give you this. In fact, half of the adult male identical twins, follow this, adult male identical twins of homosexual men, okay, so adult man, adult man, they're identical twins. Um, half of the twins, identical twins, genetically identical, of adult male homosexuals are not themselves homosexual. They're straight, <laughs> okay? They're heterosexual. So obviously, if people were born gay because of genes, right, even if it was polygenic, not just one gene, but many different genes influencing sexuality and determining that, then you would have a complete correspondence there, but that's not what we observe. Yes, there's an influence, but it falls far, far short of genetic determination. It's not even close, okay? So right there, the idea of people being born gay is disproved scientifically. Okay, so what science can and does tell us about biology and human sexuality is that genes are one of many factors that contribute to whether or not a person experiences same-sex attraction. Equally important are the environment one grows up in, what the person experiences as a child and during critical periods like adolescence, and how the child is educated by parents, by teachers, by peers, and far more significantly today than ever before, how they're educated and cultured by social media, right? These are all tremendous influences on the trajectory of a person's sexuality, their perceived sexuality, and also their sexual expression. Second point, why do Christians oppose homosexuality? Well, the call of the Christian is to oppose all sin, first and foremost, right, in our own lives. <laughs> Behold, the uh, why do you look at the speck when you have a plank in your own eye? So, First and foremost, all sin, especially as it pertains to us. Clearly, it would be wrong if a professing Christian vigorously opposed LGBT, and there are people like this, but was nonchalant and quiet about things like pornography and fornication and idolatry. But to answer the question more directly, we oppose homosexuality for the same reason that God does. Homosexuality defies how God designed human sex. It undermines the family, which was the first social institution God gave humans in order to build, to nourish us, to protect us, to provide for us, but also to contextualize our lives. And it is destructive to humans uh, physically, emotionally, and most import importantly, spiritually. We oppose behavior that misses the mark because we love people. We want to see those people receive full and abundant life from Jesus. Okay, so lastly, it's common for LGBT people to, uh, and their supporters, to ask, when did you decide to become straight? So the implication here clearly is that just like straight people didn't choose to be straight, gay people didn't wake up one day and decide to become gay. Okay, so here we would want to differentiate between sexual attraction and sexual behavior. World of difference, guys, sexual attraction versus sexual behavior. As a follower of Christ, I may well have been born straight, or, well, actually, I wasn't, but I always remember being straight, okay? Um, uh, I, I remember having, in other words, opposite sex attraction and not same-sex attraction. That's true of me. 
but I can assure you that I was not born <laughs> to find one and only one female sexually attractive. And this is the case with virtually every guy I know, okay? Uh, those of us who are straight, who only remember being straight, it's not the case that we've only found that one person, the person that we would ultimately marry, to be sexually attractive. That's, that's not what happens. So I, what do I have to do? I have to constrain my attractions according to God's prescribed parameters for sexual expression. For unmarried Christians, this means waiting until you're married for sexual activity, right? Avoiding fornication. For married Christians, it means that your sexuality is to be directed towards that one and only that one person for the rest of your life that you're married to, okay? Avoiding adultery, not being adulterers either in action or in the attitude and the meanderings of our heart and mind, right? Um, yeah, the world finds this strange on both ends, just like it finds our opposition to homosexuality that type of lifestyle behavior strange. It also finds it kind of ridiculous, and they'll even tell you this, that people should only be sexually attracted to their partner. Um, and so the world's going to find that strange, guys. We just have to accept that. Many people find this difficult to live out. I understand that, okay? But it is how the Lord commanded that his people should live. And in that commitment, a commitment to him and to that one and only that one person, we find the fullness, right? Not just of human love, but of divine love, okay? So that'll wrap it up for today. I'm compiling a list. I think I have 18 different topics. I plan to eventually do 30 of these. But as we kick off Humility Month, um, you know, be getting before the Lord and have that attitude of confession, especially uh, areas of our lives that pertain to our sexuality, um, that our hearts and our minds as believers would be fully devoted, fully set apart for the glory of God, purified, sanctified, and that we might be vessels that bring him glory and honor with our lives. God bless you, and I'll see you tomorrow.